When was the last time you really felt listened to? Like somebody deeply cared about what's going on for you, your experience, your thoughts, your feelings, and really took the time to listen. For a lot of us, that doesn't happen very often. And I would argue that a lot of us uh, have coaches and therapists just as a rent-a-friend. We're not really hoping for magic, but just to feel someone cares about us and listens, and we're willing to pay for it. Today's guest, Elise Kushner, has co-authored The Listening Book, which is a book about how to listen, the ways in which we can listen and respond to what we hear to create connection with people, to be supportive, to help people find their way, and the very common ways we disconnect, the ways that we make people feel unheard so they shut down. And we're going to talk about the book today, what she hopes it'll achieve in the world, where it came from, and we talk about some specific examples of ways in which we can connect or disconnect with the people in our lives. So without further ado, Elise Kushner, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. So we're here to talk about a book that you co-wrote uh, called The Listening Book, which I have found so helpful. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's hard to read because I, because I feel like <laughs> I find myself in all of the, the examples of, 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 of disconnection, which I guess is the point. Um, so I would love to talk about the book, about how it relates to, to your work, to what you want to you know, achieve in the world. But let's start by having you please introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I am a native New Yorker. I've lived and worked in Cologne, Germany for decades now. And uh, I studied music, which is still my great passion. I worked in IT for a long time. And then with maturing and finding my real career direction, I got involved in coaching and psychotherapy. And I have the great good fortune to have as my older sister, Robin Tissick, who's also one of the authors of this book and who works closely with the Coherent Psychology Institute with their founders, Bruce Ecker and Laurel Hulley, and who has been, uh, let's say, a, a mentor and a role model and, and a trainer for me in the area of coherence therapy, and memory reconsolidation, which I'm sure all of which we'll touch on in this conversation. Yeah. And Robin and I have a lot of overlapping interests, of course, and overlapping experiences. And the topic of communication has always been one of our great passions. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we got rolling gotcha. on this book. Gotcha. And was she, was she the one who first uh, discovered coherence therapy and memory reconsolidation of the two of you? Yeah, uh, she discovered uh, the Coherence Institute and the concepts. And um, I mean, as, as a practicing psychotherapist, she discovered that domain of knowledge and started working very closely with Bruce Ecker. And um, yeah, it's uh, the way to go, I feel. It just feels right and feels like my home. Yeah. And one, one of the reasons I am so excited to talk to you is the listening book is really the first book coming out of that group that is meant mm -hmm. for the public. You know, I'm I'm working my way through unlocking the emotional brain second edition, and honestly, I can read two to three pages at a time before I have to go have a lie down because yeah. it yeah. is it is so dense. It really it's for it it's is. for therapists, and this book was really an attempt to bring this thing, which like for me, coherence and and memory consolidation is like I've discovered this amazing band that nobody else knows about. And when I find you know I see someone else like walking down the street and they've got this the, you know the the concert T-shirt, I'm like. Sit down. Talk to me. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's. I'm curious. You know, I mean, music and IT. But like, were you doing coaching 
or before you got into before you discover the memory reconsolidation and coherence because that's where I'm coming to it from I've been a coach for 25 years and mm -hmm. all of a sudden this new thing blows mm -hmm. my mind but also has taken me way off balance like was that what was that your chronology not quite because I have the advantage that my sister Robin was deeply into this uh, for decades now that when I actually had the chance to start moving away from IT and do a coaching training and I did systemic coaching and business coaching um, I was already deeply uh, immersed in the coherence concepts so it was very clear to me even while I was going through my training I was hearing it through the filter of coherence Okay. How, how how easy was that? Because when I think about the way I learned to do coaching, I can definitely see where coherence can fit in, but it also coaching tends to be very counteractive, very, let's get it done. What's standing in your way? Okay, yeah. this way of thinking, try that way of thinking, or, you know, spend 20 minutes working on yourself in the morning. So how, right. how, how, did, how did you... And, and I think we, you know, probably my, my mind is some part of my mind that's thinking about the listeners and the viewers is we should talk about what mem what coherence and memory consolidation is probably probably first before we talk about the differences. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt myself and ask you to kind of talk about like what what what's the there there. Hmm. Yeah, the concept of coherence is that each of us has good reasons that make sense within our own reality, within our own world of life experiences for our behaviors, our feelings, our thoughts, our decisions, our mm, somatic responses, and that if we can sort of get inside the mind of another person briefly, to whatever extent that's possible, and really see how certain behaviors and emotions make sense to another person, if we can assume and appreciate the coherence of that person's life, then we can be much more accepting and we can refrain from pathologizing. We don't have to see other people as defective, but rather to that person, it makes sense that way. Mm. So that's in a nutshell what coherence is about. It's kind of a paradigm, it's a stance, it's a way of thinking, a way of being in the world, a way of looking at other people. Mm. And I found when I first was encountering it, of course, you know, it was it was very seismic and you know, it wasn't like, you know, every part of me took a vote and was like, yep, we're all on board. Right. I found it was easy in some ways it was easier to apply conceptually to other people than to myself. Mm -hmm. Right. That if I thought if I'm going to if I'm going to see coherence in all of the things I'm doing that I don't like, mm -hmm. it's almost like I lose the power to dominate them and to put them in their place and to move forward you know, as, as an alpha. Right. With discipline that's been hard learned and hard won. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it takes a kind of courage and self empathy and self love, the kind of things we try to give to other people, but it, it takes really courage to use those on ourselves and to give ourselves the space to explore what we would actually like to do differently or feel differently and to try to find out what are the reasons that this has made sense up until now. It is very difficult, and I think that's one of the reasons that it's usually more effective to work with a coach or a therapist, or as we're discovering in the listening book, even with a trusted friend or partner, or in a small group of like-minded people who are open and receptive and welcoming and non-judgmental, that can be an easier way with that kind of support and that kind of guidance actually to have the 
space and the courage to unearth the deeper parts of us. Right. It's not so easy. Yeah, which brings me to, I think, to the second thing that you mentioned, the memory reconsolidation, which is if coherence is, this is going to make sense somehow. And mm -hmm. when it makes sense, then we drop judgment and we drop pushing and it, it can lead to compassion and self-compassion and self-love, but you still got the problem. The yes. other half, this memory reconsolidation piece is that there is a process that the brain has to change, right? Yeah. To, to, to do, and not just like little change, not just incremental, but sort of a, a radical and pretty rapid at, at that moment transformation where this old pattern is seen for what it is, a sort of an echo of a memory, of an understanding, of a belief, of a schema that can then be dissolved and we can move forward without it. And I'm really curious about how how you do that as a coach, as opposed to how, how one does it as a therapist. Not really differently. A lot I'm of people. So, I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've spent a lot of time thinking about the differences between coaching and therapy, and it, for me, boils down to um, different training. Typically, I'm not talking about in the coherence world, right? Typically, it's different training. Therapists are taught about uh, illnesses, pathologies, disturbances. Um, coaches are taught to focus on uh, setting goals and the future. And so there are differences in the training, typically. And there are differences in the self-selected clients, let's say that a lot of people feel, oh, well, I'm functional in daily life. I don't need therapy. There's a stigma attached to therapy. And so maybe they'll look for a coach because it mm -hmm. they can justify it more to themselves or to their outside world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of times people really have to be in a lot of pain and say, oh, I can't even manage my everyday life. I can't get my work done. I can't get myself out of the house or my relationships are in trouble. There has to be a lot often very deep pain before someone will reach out to a therapist. So for me, those are the two major differences. But when we come back to the coherence paradigm of understanding that according to a person's life experiences, uh, it all makes sense where that person is right now and that person wants to change something, then for me, coaches and therapists work the same way. It's just that a, a coach who perhaps hasn't been trained in medical issues or hasn't been trained to know how to deal with severe trauma um, does need to know, okay, uh, this is a case where I'm at my limit of training and knowledge, if that's the case, mm. and then pass that person perhaps along to a medical professional or a psychotherapist. Yeah, wow, so a metaphor that just came to me is you know, my, my previous work was, was in the health field, helping people with health and wellness behaviors. And like it was, it's very clear if someone's got type two diabetes and their diet is terrible, that I can help them in a deeper way than a doctor can who can prescribe um, you know, medication and blood, you know, insulin and all that. Um, but if I don't understand, you know, hypoglycemic shock and mm -hmm. metabolic syndrome, then there's a limit to where I can take them. And there needs to be more safeguards in the same way that, that, you know, as a coach, I can help people up to a point, but still, but need to know where my expertise ceases so I can do it responsibly. Yeah. Right. That's, re that's really helpful for me. Thank you. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to say is, though, when you, when you, you were talking about path like therapists learn through pathology, which is essentially the medical model, right? Doctors learn the name of every disease. Like, you know, I have a friend who's um, I, he's 
still a doctor, but he's he's sort of like for the last five or six years been doing other things. But if I say, hey, I've got this thing here, like I have this little lump on, on my hand between the fingers, he, he can tell me the like the Latin name for it. And yes, it happens this like he's got this compendium in his head mm -hmm. of, of pathology and treatment that is you know unbelievably impressive. But the what I understand, what I've learned from from Bruce Ecker and Tori Olds um, is this phenomenological view that that really dispenses it doesn't dispense but it says like let's not focus on the names of pathologies let's not focus on dsm um, diagnoses not because they're they don't exist or we have a, a a philosophical or theoretical opposition to them but because they just aren't helpful because now they've they've put people in a box and and now we have a theory about it as opposed to discovering this person's uniqueness. And I'm wondering whether that's almost more coachy than, than, than therapy has been. Yeah, has been. Therapy is changing, I think. Uh, there are so many schools of therapy and models out there that are really very humane and open and accepting and mindful observing what is rather than what we expect based on a given symptom. So I think the therapy world is changing in that way. Right. But, but, but in some ways, catching up to coaching, where if I'm listening to someone describing their inability to get started in the morning to get their most important work done, mm -hmm. I tend not to think in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of categorization. Right. You know, I think in terms of like, what's let's look, let's look specifically what's been happening. What's it like? Um, because this person's is different there. It's not like, oh, this is, you know, th th someone's a night owl and someone's a morning dove or something. And right. It's like, that's not going to help me. But understanding like what goes into it. When did they go to bed? What do they have for dinner? Right. Um, how much do they care about the work they're doing? Do they have toddlers, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's the, the details that I am interested in as a coach. And I think that, that in some ways, coherence coaching is is kind of a more natural fit than even the therapy, you know, the history of therapy and, and bringing this coherence model into it. Yeah, it's a fresh way of looking at people as very specifically individuals. And what's bothering an individual is also a very specific thing. So it is a kind of coachy, as you say, a coachy way of of looking at it, being curious. And mm -hmm. us learning from the client as opposed to us being the experts on the client and teaching the client what to do. Yeah. So, so that's all sort of preamble for this amazing book in, in, in my mind, where did the idea from the listening book come from? Because when I saw it, it like, it wasn't at all obvious that this was a thing that the coherence folks mm -hmm. were going, were going to put out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, Robin and I have always been interested in communication and we've been sort of honing our own um, theories <laughs> over over decades. And uh, Robin also wrote a book about parent-child communication. And so this has been an interest of ours for a long time. And one day we were sharing, this is several years ago now, we were sharing some of our experiences in therapy with clients and telling each other about a, a client who said, you know, you're the only one who really listens to me and tries to understand me. And then the other one of us said, oh, I know, I get that all the time. Mm -hmm. That is so sad. And then the other one said, yeah, you know, and some of my clients say, you're the only person I can trust so that if I bear my deepest, darkest secrets, you won't judge me, you won't make me feel stupid, you won't tell me I'm wrong. And from there, it just became clear to us that people want to be heard and understood, 
and people want to listen and hear and understand other people. And at the same time, there's so much in the way. There's so much hurt and pain and uh, yeah, just emotional stuff in the way. So we had this idea that we really have to teach the world how to listen. And it got off to a fun but slow start in that we were just sort of collecting stories, collecting vignettes along the way and just sharing them by email back and forth about, uh, you won't believe what I experienced today or what one of my clients told me about and so on. And then we started adding stories where people were very well attuned in their listening and thinking, wow, you know, we don't really usually comment on the cases where it goes beautifully. Yeah. The person feels really understood just in passing or by chance. And at a certain point, we thought, you know, we need Bruce on this project because he has yet another set of professional and life experiences. He's the perfect addition to this team. And from that point on, we just kind of played three-way ping pong where one of us would write a little bit and send it to the others and we'd throw ideas around. And I think that we're a good team because we're three people on a mission and each of us with our own particular slant on on the mission, but really big overlaps that we want to, of course, as psychotherapists, we want to help people become more happy. We want them to see the potential to keep developing in life. And, and, and for all three of us, I would say, I guess I should speak only for myself, but I'm sure it's true of the others. There is something so fulfilling about having that deep connection with our clients. And we've all learned to kind of take that into everyday life and just see that coherence is something that benefits everyone. It benefits those who are being more accepted and not pathologized. It also benefits the listeners it I, I was reading recently about some studies about how personnel from old age homes and hospitals have a much lower incidence of burnout when they're taught to deal mindfully and with curiosity toward their patients and so that's really what listening is about Right. Mm -hmm. It's uh, being an open vessel, being a welcoming, open vessel, uh, a space for other people to feel seen, heard and understood. And for the one receiving that gift of somebody sharing, it's also very fulfilling. And that's optimally what psychotherapy and coaching do for the practitioner also. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah, something something just happened inside me that I'm not quite sure what it is. I had another question written down, but I need to go here a little bit. It's so so like one one of the very, I would say, binary distinctions that that Bruce makes um, in his teaching and that I'm reading in the. Um, unlocking the emotional brain is the difference between transformational change and counteractive change. And he's pretty clear. And I've been playing with like, is it, is there a continuum? Is there something sort of in the middle? Because like we talk about like, you know, okay, if I do some polyvagal exercises with someone who is very upset, well, that's counteractive. That's just calming them down. But the way you're talking about just giving people the experience of being listened to non-judgmentally accepted allowed appreciated attended to is there is there something transformational in there as opposed to just being counteractive to like oh i i feel better in the moment but i still have all these problems it 
can be transformational. It's very individual. If there's an underlying, um, let's say, construct in a client's brain that I am not worth listening to or uh, no one can really feel my pain mm. or any number of other very deep constructs, um, it can be that through the relationship to the coach or the therapist that that person has a juxtaposition experience and says, oh, wow, uh, there's something happening that uh, I always assumed didn't exist that can be transformational. Mm. It you have to look at the individual case. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, because I'm thinking, you know, as first I was thinking that maybe this is only for attachment, but I think there's there's probably a broad range of people's experiences of just not, you know, especially in the workplace of mm -hmm. not, you know, just like how life is like, nobody's got time for me. Like one of the things I recognize when I moved to Spain is like, I've lived in this little village. I don't speak the language. I don't know anybody. I've kind of made more friends here than I have mm -hmm. in 18 years in where I lived in North Carolina, just because people have time. Mm -hmm. Right. And that kind of was, you know, it wasn't about I'm unworthy to listen to, or no one can understand me, but it was, it was some kind of a disconfirmation about how people can be together. And yeah. I think what you're talking about is like, it's, it's the gift of, of attention and patience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then on top of that, uh, there's the potential process that, um, let's say, a struggling person can go through with a good listener uh, to unearth particular emotional truths bring them to awareness, things that maybe were learned long ago and never really looked at, than to shine a light on them just because there's somebody there who cares and who's listening. And so even some very specific personal learnings mm. can in this um, fruitful and welcoming environment actually be transformed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I've been, I've been, you know, workshopping workshops, thinking about how to bring this, how to bring memory reconsolidation, coherence to teams and organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think I've been getting ahead of myself in terms of like, oh, we're going to do transformational work, right? But I think like what you're saying is like the, the primary um, task is can we create a place where people feel a little bit safer than they do right now, mm -hmm. right? That be, that become and that's and and what I'm hearing you say, or what I, what I want to hear you say, and I think I'm hearing you say, is that that in itself can be transformational for some people under some circumstances, can make things a whole lot better, even if they're not doing the kind of magic that Robin and Bruce and Tori and sometimes I can do with a client where we, we do the whole coherence thing, you know, A, B, C, one, two, three, V, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they magically no longer have the symptom but that, that simply through creating a community of, of listeners for coherence, that some of that just drops away of its own yeah. accord. Yeah, because even in uh, canonical coherence therapy, we recognize that juxtapositions and disconfirmations of old schemas do happen spontaneously in everyday life. Well, when do they happen? They happen when people are aware through sharing, through self-reflection, when people are aware of their old constructs and when they are then in an environment where things are different from their expectations. Mm. So this concept of spontaneous juxtaposition is a thing. Mm, yeah. Well, um, because, you know, I, I write a lot about confirmation bias. 
right? Like, okay, so someone wasn't listened to as a child, or they were told they were stupid by teachers or relatives. And now they're in a, you know, they've risen in the organization to a pretty high position, and they still have this view of I'm not worth listening to, when every single day, multiple times a day, people are showing them, you know, like dancing and parades mm -hmm. with hula hoops and elephants, like, we really need you, you know, you're brilliant, we need you. And yet, it doesn't mm -hmm. sink in. So what is it about listening in the way you're talking about and you write about in the listening book that can shift the confirmation bias to, to if not to a disconfirmation bias, at least into mm -hmm. a, a neutral space? Yeah, well, confirmation bias is a, a term. It's a label for something that you may observe. What's really interesting is what's underneath it. So in coherence therapy, for example, we're always asking ourselves the question, what makes this symptom? So the symptom you're talking about is the person in the CEO or whoever feeling unworthy, right? Mm -hmm. What makes this symptom today necessary to have? what makes it make sense and what makes it necessary to have. So it's not just that the person is hanging on to it um, because it's nice to have old things confirmed. It's that there's something maybe even scarier out there unconsciously um, about letting it go. And so listening is a major prerequisite and a major factor, empathetic listening uh, to that person reflecting, having, let's say, the courage and the, the trust to reflect on what is that danger out there that's even bigger and scarier than what I'm dealing with right now that I've kept out of my view and suppressed all this time. And that can really come out best in a, in a situation where the person feels, ah, there's somebody who cares, who's receptive, who's open, non-judgmental, interested, not going to give me advice, just going to let me find out my own truth. Wow. You, you kind of blew my mind just there. <laughs> <Good. Right? So laughs> cause, yeah, because like, because you, I mean, you tell you, you know, it's like, I think I, I had a complete lacuna around and I'm trying now, like my mind is going, what other phrases from the trade have I just adopted as re reified mm -hmm. as things Mm -hmm. And not been curious about what's underneath them. So you're kind of you're kind of inviting me to to ask: Is confirmation bias just a hu a heuristic of the brain in every single mm -hmm. case? Like mm -hmm. we always want to just be consistent and think today what we thought yesterday, or in you know maybe maybe it's a you know a two percent, like like the bell curve would you know in, in a totally neutral thing like the bell curve would shift 2% in one direction or the other mm -hmm. based on based on just the the brain conservation of thought mm -hmm. but you know like but the curiosity about okay so confirmation bias I'm throwing around that term like I know what I'm talking about and yet it's driven by something it's it doesn't have to be this giant weight that we have to mhm mm Right. It's like, like, so, so another one that's coming to, I'm, I'm, I'm talking more in this interview than I almost ever do. And, and, and I, 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 don't, I just, I want to, I want to thank you for it because I'm processing things. I, I always, you know, I don't like to be the, 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 the host who just talks all the time, but, but you're really pushing me to process stuff like this, the whole sort of like positivity, negativity, like, you know, what's the, the social science phrase for, you know, like negativity bias. Mm -hmm. Right. We're all. And so my mind is going, well, it's it's better to 
assume negative just from an evolutionary perspective. If I assume that twig snapping is a predator and I run away, I pass on my genes. But now you got me thinking like, is negativity bias also largely an attempt to, to maintain coherence of some deeper thing? Mm -hmm. I guess a uh, um, kind of a, a pair of glasses we could put on for this would be the question of how adaptive is it? And also to look at individuals, even though, you know, we have this habit in sort of Western science that if we can measure it, then it's a thing. <laughs> And if it's sort of on the tail ends of the bell curve or it's hard to measure, then it's not a thing. And I think that we need to look more and more at individuals. So just going back to confirmation bias, you had that CEO of the company. Um, as long as that person uh, is happy and everything's fine, then that's... Um, fine for the CEO to believe whatever that person believes. Mm. If that person is unhappy and coming to you as a coach because something needs to change, then there's more digging to be done. And that person's underlying reasons are going to be different from the next CEO's underlying reasons. So looking at individuals, I think, is... Uh, something that I've really learned from doing coherence therapy, that everyone is very specific. Everyone's life learnings are quite different from everyone else's, although you find overlaps and, mm -hmm. and patterns and so on. So negativity bias, maybe you'd have to give me uh, an example of an individual that you're working with and how it manifests itself. And then we start asking, you know, what are the underlying learnings that make it necessary to look that way? And is it adaptive for the person? It may be that up until the age of 55, that way of looking at something was totally adaptive and functional and made that person happier than whatever the alternative would be. And then the person notices I'm not really happy with this and it's time to change something and I want to look at it. And that's when you start realizing it's perhaps no longer adaptive. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. I, I, yeah, I need to do much more processing of this before I can say anything intelligent in response, but except for <laughs> thank you. Like, wow, this is, uh, this is really sort of lo loosening up some of the, the, tensions and cartilage around my coaching methodology. So I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. So to totally, totally related and unrelated question. Um, do you, when you coach someone, do you d have them do any sort of diagnostics? What, right, because part of me is like, there's, there's, there's like languages in diagnostics, you know, like Myers-Briggs or DISC or Passion Profiler or Strengths Finder or, or EQI, any of these that can provide a common language and, and actually can, can impart some degree of coherence because they are, they're saying, oh, this is, this is a way to be that's perfect. You know, it's not like, you know, you're broken and you're great, but they're all different styles. And at the same time, there's something about the phenomenological look at the individual that, mm -hmm. that might say that, that, that even a good label or a useful label might have more drawbacks. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't have a sort of yes or no or right or wrong. You have to know your client and what's going to be useful or at least what's worth trying out to see whether it's useful. I don't tend to do diagnostics or use models that lead to labels, but there are people for whom labels are actually useful. I actually have a client right now who has told me that if she had a label like um, um, 
I don't know, like being on the autism spectrum or something. I'm just anonymizing and making this up. But, um, but if she had a label or a diagnosis, it would make it easier for her in the particular um, health system in the country that she lives in to get the kind of attention and understanding that she needs. Okay, so for her, that's a useful thing. It's not useful for lots of people. And so my my general, I, I start from the point of view of this is an individual and we're just going to find out. I'm going to try to get inside this person's head, see how the world looks from that standpoint, what makes sense about all of this. But there are models that can help. And I think that your intuition, you're a very intuitive person, I sense, um, your intuition will guide you there. I don't start with that, but there are, for example, you know, in coherence therapy, there's um, there are certain concepts that are sort of intellectually rigorous for us as coaches and therapists, like the model of the two sufferings. Right, so, um, we will always choose the lesser suffering, even though it's a suffering, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because the other one is uh, inconceivable and bigger and scarier. And there are times that I get the instinct with a client that if I could just explain that model to the client, even though it's not our usual way of working experientially, if I could just get the person to understand, you know, yes, it makes sense, even though that's a great suffering, because there is something else uh, that it would help. And then it usually does. So that's a very yeah. sort of uh, yeah. nebulous answer. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I, I, yeah, I, the, I wouldn't use the word nebulous. I would use the word contextual. Right. Yeah. So I like I pride myself. I read this phrase in Stephen Hayes's book, um, The Liberated Mind. It was called uh, functional contextualism. Mm -hmm. And and after I looked up the words, I was like, my God, that's me. Like, mm -hmm. I don't you know, it depends. It depends. And let's see right? if it works. And I, and I, I feel like I have I have just met my uh, my functional contextualist guru. Like you've you're several <laughs> layers <laughs> The functional contextualism of like, oh, wow, I feel like like things are popping. Yeah. And so for you as a coach, you're being utterly mindful. You're noticing what do I sense this person needs? Uh, what could help clarify something? Then you try something out because we don't know everything, mm -hmm. right? We're yeah. not... Uh, yeah. We're not the expert on that person. We try something out and then we notice along with the client what has happened. Has that been useful on our our path or has it not been useful? You know, it's very since you're interested in health and nutrition and things like that, I thought it's very parallel to um, there are people who let's say eat the way they've always eaten at their parents' table, and as long as they feel fine and healthy and they have no complaints, they don't even stop and question what they're eating. They just continue that way. As soon as they notice that something, that they're not quite healthy or something doesn't feel good or they need more of something or less of something, then they start becoming questioning and mindful and they'll try something new and then notice how do I feel? Right. So basically, that's what we're doing as coach, coaches and therapists is helping the person try something new and notice what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my yeah, my immediate reaction to that is that the listening book is a very important thing in the world for that, because it's not my experience that people start changing when they feel bad, as long as the people around them are mirroring it. Right. Yeah. Like. I got I, one of my best friends is from South Louisiana. This is you know the the heaviest state in the union. What number one or number two? It's like nobody you know nobody looks around and says, "Oh my God, I'm fat," because everyone looks around and says, "I'm normal." Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so in the same way, like the levels of emotional distress and pain and the different like joylessness that I think a lot of us feel are pretty normal, and the feelings of disconnection. And so yeah. reading the listening book. 
and reading, it starts out with, you know, these like, 50, I think, 52 vignettes of little conversations and there's mm -hmm. you stamp a, an icon next to an ouch where there's mm -hmm. a disconnection or a little a heart with an ear coming off of it when there's a connection and realizing like connection is so rare mm -hmm. yeah and yet we all do it sometimes right there's a whole spectrum from people who feel it occasionally to people who are able to have that be uh, the flow of their everyday lives, lucky people. Um, and so what we try to do in the listening book is kind of to distill our observations based on long years of clients, friends, family, uh, personal experiences, to distill what we see going on when people achieve deep connection and what we see going on when that's painfully lacking. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, you talk about how people just keep on as long as the environment that they're in supports that. It's a very systemic kind of concept, right? That once there's a working system, um, it, doesn't tend to change unless one element of the system does something differently. And that's often the case with humans, that there's somebody who says, oh, this is painful, this isn't working for me, I don't know what to do differently, but I'm going to try something. And mm -hmm. then that upsets the, the balance of the system and things can start to change. Yeah. And I think that um, it's hard. I think one of the challenges about trying to make this a more listening world is that so many people are in such pain that they're very busy with themselves. Mm -hmm. and they don't really have much spare capacity to be that welcoming, receptive, almost egoless vessel for listening to other people. And so how do we, it becomes sort of a vicious circle because if they can't do that for other people, then those people also are in pain, right? And the more I've thought about it, the more I think that the way out of that vicious circle is a kind of mindfulness. It's starting learning in very small steps, it can be, but making any change at all in the direction of noticing self-observation, noticing what happens if I try something new. Just as we were discussing before as a coach or a therapist, you're noticing, is this helping my client or not? Um, and just noticing, ah, oh, if I make this small change, what happens? And so that's why the book is chock full of possible small changes that people yeah. can make. And I certainly don't, we don't expect anybody to say, okay, now I read that book, I'm gonna do all 52 connectors and disconnectors differently from now on. That's not how we grow. How we grow is trying something out and feeling like, oh, wow, that gave me a new experience. Yeah. And now I own that experience. And now I have the energy and the goodwill to, try the next little experiment well i think yeah, i think and that's that's sort of like the way exposure therapy works at its best when when you set it up so that it can lead to a disconfirmation yeah because right? because i think it's it, it's we're in such pain and the idea of listening to somebody else first <laughs> right feels risky it's almost mm -hmm. like you know you tell someone here's a slot machine it's got a hundred percent you know, it's a 200% payoff. You put in a dollar, you get two back. But we feel like we're such paupers. If I've got a dollar, I'm not putting it in the machine, right? But then yeah. it's like, you know, if my wife's upset and I have to say like, and she's upset at something adjacent to me and, I, and my natural thing is to defend myself and explain why she's wrong or explain she doesn't understand the context or to, right? That continues the the drama and the, the 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 unhappy dance where but it feels so risky to say tell me more mm -hmm. about what you're experiencing because she might tell me more yeah 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 
right? Yeah. So and and yet to do it, and you know, and I'm much better doing this as a coach than I am as a husband, <laughs> and I'm and I'm much better doing it um, with other people than with family members, mm -hmm. right? There's people out there who would tell you I'm a very empathetic listener, and my children are <laughs> not often among them, right? But but this like I, okay, every time I do it, and I realize. It doesn't hurt. In fact, it, I mean, it may hurt for a minute, like to really hear, oh, wow, have mm -hmm. I been um, inconsiderate? I totally didn't see that. Like, yeah, that sucks. Mm -hmm. but, then, but then seeing like, okay, the other person is trusting me a little bit more there. You know, I ask questions and now they're getting to what's really going on. Yeah. Like, okay, so I'm starting to have disconfirmations about how dangerous it is and you know the risk benefit uh, analysis shifts completely to right and this there's this word we use like i want to be vulnerable mm -hmm. which i think is a it's a terrible <laughs> word to use because it implies i'm going to be wounded mm -hmm. right where it, it doesn't feel that way once you've done it mm -hmm. yeah in a trusting relationship yeah and you know that's why we put exercises at the back of the book also. I love, I love those exercises. Could you talk about a couple of them? Yeah, it starts very, very simply so that really almost anybody can do it. And it start, the first exercise is, for example, opening the listening door, metaphorically speaking, where all you're doing in the role of listener is listening, not saying anything. You don't even have to nod your head. You're just giving the other person time and space to talk about something. Then you reverse roles. It starts very, very basically. You reverse roles and then you have a chance for debriefing after. And in the debriefing, after such a simple exercise, simple but not easy, let's put it that way. Um, in the debriefing, there's the opportunity to share, again, without being judged or interrupted, to share how it was for you as listener to uh, not intervene, to you can then share in the debriefing what kinds of thoughts ran through your mind. And there's the opportunity then to share for you as speaker what it was like really not to be interrupted, not to be judged, not to be criticized, just to have the time and space. And so it begins with the very simplest of exercises and then just builds little by little where the listener learns how to show interest actively. And then we have some exercises where we purposely ask the participants to do it uh, in a poorly attuned way, like what we would call not effective listening. For example, you tell me a story about yourself and I immediately respond by shifting the, the focus onto me about some time that I experienced something similar, right? So do it first in a poorly attuned way and now wipe the slate cr clean start over again, do it in an attuned way where I give you the, the space and keep the focus on you while you're speaking. And then during the debriefing, explore what are the differences. And we want this book to be experiential. Mm -hmm. You know, in coherence therapy and coaching, we're always talking about how the client can transform things by having subjective experiences that feel true. It's not theoretical. It's not cognitive. And although there's a lot of information in the book about listening and about these connectors and disconnectors, a lot of background and so on, we designed the book to be as experiential as possible starting with the vignettes in the beginning that the reader can really feel what the protagonist is going through and live with the protagonist and ending with 
these, I think, 10 or 11 exercises to be done with a partner where the whole goal is for each person to experience something because you know what you experience, you own, you have it with you for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, I, and I love, you know, the, the androgagy, the, the adult education wisdom in having people do it wrong on purpose, mm -hmm. right? Because people are so nervous about doing it wrong mm -hmm. and telling them like, okay, you know, here, give advice immediately. Like, oh yeah, I'm, I could do that. And then, and then that, when you do it intentionally, you know, the thing you've been doing reflexively, once you start mm -hmm. doing it intentionally, you actually, that's one way to gain agency over it, as opposed to saying, stop doing it, right? There's much right. less agency in that. So it's a, it's a brilliantly constructed part of the book. Mm. Oh, I'm glad you see it that way. Yeah. In fact, I know multiple couples, married couples, who are working on the book together. Like mm. they'll read a story and then... At the end of every story, there are four questions for discussion, and mm. then they'll discuss it. And, and the questions are designed to have the reader do some discovery inside him or herself. The, the questions, uh, some of them urge us to empathize with the protagonist who maybe felt not well heard or well heard. And some of the questions are designed to have us try to understand and empathize with the listener who maybe wasn't able at that moment to listen fully, openly, or without his or her own agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's this kind of empathizing that helps the reader have subjective experiences. Boy, I'm, uh, I'm I'm brainstorming workshops in my head. I'm only I'm only giving you seventy five percent of my attention right now, to be honest. Like I'm mm -hmm. I'm thinking like you could do this with with you know scene, famous scenes from movies, um, having you know dyads in in group. Do you do workshops on this in organizations? I haven't yet, only due to a lack of time because of other trainings and clients and uh, presentations and whatever, but. Ever since we got this book ready for publication, we've been brainstorming about how we really need to do workshops, create YouTube videos, um, online courses, all sorts of things based on this material, because mm -hmm. it lends itself really nicely to that. It's very modularized and yeah, very, yeah. very workshoppy. <laughs> Well, I'm 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 going to be presumptuous enough to email you because I, I I have lots Thank of excitement please. and ideas around this. Yeah, so, maybe uh, we can cooperate in some way. Awesome. Yeah, sounds like a great idea. Yeah. So because but, we have to get these concepts out into the world, you know, it's going to yeah. be a better world when people listen to each other more. Yeah, yeah. It's one one of one of my friends and teachers, Peter Bregman, talks about. He always does the work to create the world that he wants to live in. Yeah. It's like, man, yes. a world in which people know how to listen to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That sounds awesome. Yeah. So be before we go, I want to give people just a, a bit of the concreteness of, so you've got connectors and disconnectors, but there's there's about tw two dozen connectors. I, I'm, I've got the Kindle here, so I'm not uh -huh. flipping back and forth, but yeah. like attending to the others, pressing needs first, maintaining focus on the speaker, asking interestedly, active listening, asking rather than telling, showing warmth and generosity of spirit. So there's a there's a, a big list. I'm wondering if in your mind you have like one or two or three that are mm -hmm. like fundamental, like just so I don't have to memorize all of these. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're all fundamental, Howie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the most fundamental, I would say, is um, assuming coherence in other people mm. because why, why is that yeah Go ahead. why is that yeah because that gives us the patience uh and the humility of saying i don't know why 
the other person is behaving that way. Mm. So when you say assuming coherence, could you put that into like a little thought bubble? Like, like I wouldn't walk up to someone who's suffering or yelling at me and say, I assume coherence, right? If, if I were thinking that way, I would be thinking something much more colloquial. Like what would, what's the, the phrase that would, that people could mm -hmm. understand? They must have their reasons. They must have their reasons. This, this makes sense somehow. This makes sense somehow. Right. That's a good one. Yeah. Right. And and it's yeah. not that they're broken somehow. Like right. they're not they're not bad or wrong. This somehow this is this makes sense. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it just leads me to a thought that I think is very important. Even if everything that other people do makes sense in their versions of reality doesn't mean that I have to like it. This is important because some people say, well, if I go around saying, well, it makes sense, it's very coherent, then I'm just going to be the victim all the time. No. There are behaviors that I am not willing to have in my life. There are people <laughs> that I am not willing to have in my life. And at the same time, I can recognize, fine, for him or for her, that's totally coherent. Go live your coherent life. That's fine. Yeah. Mm. There's a distinction there that I think is very mm. important. It's my job to listen to myself and understand my own coherent needs and desires and to uh, treat myself respectfully in that I don't let... Uh, anybody do anything to me right i think that's an important point mm, yeah and i think you know what comes to mind is that uh it can go beyond like okay you know blessings upon your coherent life just far away from me like i'm thinking i think a lot about what's going on in gaza and mm -hmm. you have two groups of people and i can see the coherence in both mm -hmm. and yeah. yet there are there are, there are actions and behavior like like killing each other is not okay, right. right? Like, like there's even like, I will stop you from doing this thing to hurt me, to hurt other people, even, even though I understand your coherence. And I, I have friends who are, who are doing work with groups, with, you know, mm -hmm. Palestinian, Israeli groups together. And the fundamental shift always comes through coherence. Yeah. Through, you know, uh, you came in as my enemy, but now I see you're a human being. And I can yeah. see why you're mad. And I can see mm -hmm. why you'd want to hurt me. Yeah. Right. And and we're not, and, and we are setting boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, it is possible to find some overlaps in each group's realities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I also, you didn't ask about my favorite disconnectors, but um, oh. I also have yeah, a please. favorite a favorite disconnector, which is criticizing. Mm. And I know, and this is my favorite one because I know I differ from almost everybody else and it's a very controversial topic. People feel, oh, you should be uh, capable of taking criticism. It's a question of maturity and stuff like that. I don't see it that way. I consider criticism to be the opposite of empathy and mm. I think that there's um, yeah if you in your reality and given your life experience feel that it's okay or good to do things a certain way and I, in my life experience, find that that's not a good way to do things, then who am I to tell you that in your life it's wrong? See, the thing about criticism is that it's based on a, a concept of right and wrong. Mm. And in interpersonal relationships, there's very little that falls into the realm of right and wrong. I mean, there are things we have laws for, like we say, we agree that it's wrong to kill other people, sure. 
beyond that, I don't really have a right. I'm not the expert on your life, and I don't really have the right to tell you that's wrong. What I do have the right to do always is to say, I feel this, I need this, I don't like that. So, but that's not criticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and criticism, you know, it's, it's such an easy default. And, and yet, like for someone to respond well to criticism, like I can think of three people in my life ever who had that superpower. That's like, mm -hmm. you know, like, like we should all be able to jump off of buildings and, and fly. <laughs> Right, would like, be nice, <laughs> <laughs> and yet expecting yeah. it of others. Like one, one, one of my favorite, old, I think, cartoon. I think it's from the New Yorker from years back. Is a guy uh, in an office with a like a big hammer, and everyone's is like he's obviously beat everybody up with it. And he says, "Am I the only person around here who's not playing the victim?" That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So all right. So so the 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 number one connector is assumption of coherence something something's got to make sense here which leads you said to patience and humility to me what it leads to as as a motive force is curiosity mm -hmm. um which is like oh here's a fun puzzle like why yeah. are they why are they so mad at me i really yeah. i'm really you know like the curiosity can almost like if they're even if they're coming at me with criticism Right. The curiosity is kind of this nice, you know, donut glaze layer that kind of makes whatever's underneath it um, hearable. Um, mm -hmm. and, Anthropologist and, view of things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and criticizing as the disconnector. Um, now, criticizing. And by the way, I want to just check in with you because we're about 15 minutes past when I promised you could be done. So I want to make sure I'm not keeping you from, from other things right now. Do we have a few more minutes? A few more minutes, 10 minutes, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Criticism. We know what it's, what sort of classic criticism sounds like, but there's, there's, there's ways to criticize that we may think aren't criticism, right? Like, you know, even like giving advice can be criticism. Or even mm -hmm. trying to motivate someone can be criticism or asking leading questions. Like, so mm -hmm. how, how do you, how, how can, you know, the sniff test for, for criticism, like what, what are the dynamics rather than just, you know, saying it's a word? Hmm. Yeah, making clear uh, a judgment or a non-acceptance of how another person is doing something or what another person has has said mm. yeah epitomized by you messages mm. but as you say there are many ways to imply criticism like one doesn't do that <laughs> mm. uh <-huh. laughs> right or have you thought about this Mm -hmm. Right. So I guess uh, so. So it's the 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 whiff, the the underlying energy of of judgment and non acceptance. Yeah, and even something very subtle like it's also one of our disconnectors. Um, reassuring someone inappropriately is a kind of well, it's certainly counteractive. And anything that's counteractive is a kind of implicit criticism saying you're wrong for feeling what you're feeling. Like if you're insecure about some big presentation you're about to give and, and I reassure you and say, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Mm. Then what I'm doing is implicitly criticizing you for feeling insecure about it rather than being curious what are the aspects that you're unsure about and what are you picturing possibly going wrong and so on yeah 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 and then i mean there it's an example where it's pretty i think it would be pretty straightforward to lead someone into a juxtaposition experience like oh what do you know about that what have your experience you know what if you what's what's a you know a recent experience of you giving a talk how did it go Right, where mm -hmm. you're really mm -hmm. you're really interested in the answer and you're not trying right. to lead them. Right. Yeah. yeah. That is so, that and reassuring inappropriately. I've got to say, like I I train coaches and 
the two things are advice giving. And I've always started with, with an exercise that was a little too advanced. Now that you've told me about, and you've reminded me about the just listening, just shut up and listen. Like that has to start. I start with like just asking curiosity questions and even that's too much. Mm -hmm. But like the advice giving and then the reassurance. Oh no, there's nothing wrong with you. Oh, you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. right? Oh, you've got nothing to worry about. You studied so hard. Right, right. Yeah, we have a story, a vignette in the book about a little girl who doesn't like the artwork that she just made. And she's trying to tell her mother, oh, I don't like it. I'm not happy with it. And the mother says, oh, but it's beautiful. You're a wonderful artist. And she feels so cut off from her mother because she feels not seen and heard in her upset feelings. Yeah, yeah. And we just, you uh, know, as parents, like all I want my, do my kids to do is to not feel that way, right? So, th and this is the equivalent right. of like, oh, you you feel, you know, someone someone made fun of you. Here's chocolate, right? right. Which is which is right. kind of like that was my childhood. Like chocolate was the solution to most emotional issues. Oh, uh huh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And and parents mean well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They just want their kid not to be in pain, which I totally get. Right, right. So again, coherence for the perpetrator as well, for the, the one who disconnected as a listener. Yeah. 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 So I want to make sure we, we, we leave after giving you um, a chance to tell people how to find you, how to reach you. I don't know if you still, if, if you take where you take clients from, if you work remotely or just in person, but uh, how to, and you know, how people can study with you like this is i learned so much from you i think i've modeled what other people can get so uh how how would you like people nice. to uh to stay in touch and... yeah well um through the coherent psychology institute and i know you know the uh website for that for coherenceinstitute.org and I and have... I, th I think it's actually it actually like I've, I've gone there and it's actually flipped to like coherencetherapy.org yeah, they both lead there. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I had some trouble and... with Coherence Institute, so I want to make sure people get people directly. Yeah. So coherencetherapy.org yeah. will will get them to you you're in there somewhere? <laughs> yeah, under contacts, but my okay. email address through the institute is elise.kushner at coherenceinstitute.org. <laughs> Um, so people can contact me at any time. I do give trainings for the Institute in coherence therapy, coherence coaching. Um, I do trainings in German for both of those topics. I do supervision. I work remotely, so mm -hmm. I can work with people all over the world. So if someone's looking for a coach, they, and and they like what they've heard and they feel a connection. They can just reach they out to you. Contact me, sure. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah. All right. Any anything you want to add before we uh, say goodbye? Mm, just that it's been lots of fun. It's oh, a good. great topic to delve into, and no end of interesting ramifications. I think for these topics, and it's very rewarding that you're so excited by it so we have that in common and i just encourage everybody to read the book not so that we mm -hmm. have lots of sales but so that lots of people do the learning you know you can um, get together in small groups i think a group of four people is perfect sort of like a mini book club and mm -hmm. you can spend an entire year just going through uh you know, one or two vignettes and the discussion questions and then doing the, the partner exercises together. There's so much autodidactic material in there and I encourage people to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your your book is one, there's very few books, you know, there's like the EGOT, like people, you know, people who've won an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar and a Tony. So your, your book is close because I have the Kindle and the um hard, hard copy. copy yeah really and I, and I don't have the i don't have the audiobook because i don't think there is one right there isn't one no so uh when, well, when you come out with thought <laughs> well talk talk to me so we have uh i've you know two kids who are uh actors who would love to 
wow. to do so, to do some of the voices. And it, uh -huh. it, I think it would it would be a great audio book if you had an ensemble cast doing the voices rather than just right. one reader. Right, uh, real life when, types of things, yeah. But is that is that important to me that I want to have it in multiple formats and and available to me wherever because it's such a good reminder. Mm. Oh, so that, that, that's very moving that it has resonated so much with you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's got to everyone's got to read it and work through it. Then 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 I'll have the world that I want. <laughs> right. All right. Elise Kushner, thank you so much for all the work you do in the world and for blowing my mind several times today and for just uh, being so generous with your time. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been great. Take care. Take care. And that's a wrap. Find the show notes at plantyourself.com slash 592. You'll see links to everything we talked about. Movement news. I uh, played Ultimate on Sunday. It was a hot day on the beach, and there were only eight of us, so we played three on three with subs after doing some drills, and I was dragging. The points felt like they were twice as long as they should be, and I had to go out and rest a lot. So it's been three weeks since I played on sand. Two weeks ago, we had the, the grass tournament in Lerma. The week after that, uh, we just took the week off. So three weeks really did a number on my cardio. So this morning I got out there on the beach early and ran a bunch of sprints. Uh, started trying to do some hip openers with uh, sort of called curtsy squats, or if you want to be manly about it, scorpion squats with my trainer, Jay. And I hit a personal record for push-ups 24 in a row. That matches the best I'd ever done back in the day when I was uh, doing them every morning. So looking forward to hitting 30 at some point. That's pretty cool. And what else is going on? Um, got an inversion table. I've been hearing from a lot of people how it helps decompress the lumbar spine and relieve uh, stiffness and pain. And uh, took two hours to get it set up, uh, which didn't help my back. But uh, after that, I uh, had lunch, so I'm waiting for food to get digested. Then I'm going to go upside down a little bit, and I'll report back how it does. I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful. Um, so there's a whole bunch of great conversations coming up. And I have, you, know, you may have noticed I have this uh, theme I've been running with, which is talking to people who are experts at helping other people uh, achieve their dreams, uh, help, helping organizations do better, helping individuals, so working with coaches, therapists. And I've been talking to people, um, many of whom have been helping me personally on the podcast with my own issues. And so I think that there is probably, um, especially this last uh, few months in the coming few months, um, there's a broad applicability, broad interest in the types of things I'll be talking about with my guests. And if you'd like to help, just tell one person about the podcast and maybe mention one or two episodes that you found particularly helpful. And that'll help spread the word and spread all the goodness of all these people that I'm finding and uh, are so happy and willing to share their brilliance for free for an hour uh, on this channel. So just tell one person, that'd be awesome. And um, I will see you again here next week. As always, be well, my friends.